dressed in conservative suits, dark skirts that cover their knees in modest blouses. Oftentimes they carry a Bible with their pamphlets and the pamphlets have titles like, Where Will You Spend Eternity? And Armageddon, what is it and when will it come? You see them walking in twos up the street because Jesus sent his disciples in twos. And when I was in high school, more than a few times after the bus dropped me off, I'd walk into the house and find my grandfather sitting at the kitchen table drinking coffee with Jehovah Witnesses. I'd say hello and mention how much homework I had and run into my bedroom until I heard the front door shut and knew it was safe to come back out. My grandfather's only connection to any church by, was by association through his long dead wife. And when my mother started taking my brother and I to the Baptist church three towns over, my grandfather stayed home and mentioned that if he ever decided to join us, that the ceiling of the church would certainly fall in. Which is why when I asked my grandfather why exactly it was that he was letting Jehovah Witnesses into the kitchen anytime they knocked, his response was just simply, they're nice girls. I imagine that the nice girls had to have known after the second or fifth time that they visited our kitchen that they probably weren't going to save Bill McGregor. And I also imagine that on hot days, it was nice to know that somewhere along their route, there was that old man who would let them in the kitchen and give them a glass of ice water and share an Entenmann's cheese Danish with them. And the memory of that for me has always posed this question. Who was proselytizing at the kitchen table? Was it the ladies who left pamphlets? Or was it the old man who always let them in? When Jesus sends the disciples out, he doesn't give them much of a script. He does tell them to do lots of astonishing things like cure the sick and raise the dead and cleanse the lepers and cast out demons. But the only thing that he tells them to say is that the kingdom of heaven has come near. What Jesus means by the kingdom of heaven coming near is up for grabs, as far as I'm concerned. Maybe the Jehovah Witnesses pamphlets are right, and the kingdom of heaven drawing near means the apocalypse is on its way, and some of us will be raptured, and the rest of us will be damned but I don't buy it because I just don't think that's what Jesus was selling. And the best I can figure out is that the kingdom of heaven coming near is when people don't follow the script they've been handed about who to slam the door on and who to let in, who to love and who to hate. You could take Jesus choosing Matthew, the tax collector, as an example. Matthew's the one this morning's gospel is attributed to. And any remotely patriotic Jew in Roman-occupied Israel would have been repulsed at a sellout like Matthew, who 
lined his pockets with money squeezed from his own people to fill the already overflowing coffers of an empire that had just about colonized the known world. But Jesus didn't follow the script. He loved Matthew, the tax collector. And because of that, for Matthew, and later then for us, the kingdom of heaven drew near. And the same thing happens over and over again in the Gospels. A centurion soldier comes to beg Jesus to heal his servant. And instead of slamming the door, Jesus is wowed by the centurion's faith and goes ahead and does it. And Jesus has dinner with members of the clergy, even though they think he's a heretic. And then Jesus goes out again and proves that he is a heretic by having dinner the following week with a bunch of notorious sinners who the Pharisees wouldn't even allow in their synagogues. And by the time Jesus is done, it's really hard to follow who his team is, who his people are, and who they aren't. And that's especially true when he finishes his earthly ministry on a cross which he was certainly nailed to by a centurion. And then he turns to a crucified criminal on his right, promising him that they'll be eating Entenmann's cheese danishes and having coffee in paradise before the day's through. The people who Jesus loves offend even each other for their moral weakness, their criminal behavior, their hypocrisy, their ar arrogance, their hateful associations, and their nasty character flaws. But Jesus' love is irresistible because it isn't reserved for the good. It isn't even reserved for the converted or the convicted. Jesus' love, love just is what it is. It's an open door. It's a welcome. It's a party you can choose to go to or not. Matthew says that Jesus gives the disciples authority. And the word authority in the Greek, exousia, also can mean besides authority, the freedom to choose. And that's no small thing, the freedom to choose. Because Jesus gives his disciples the freedom to choose not to divide the world into good people and bad people, into us and into them. Which means you don't have to hate Derek Chauvin. You don't have to hate the people who have taken the occasion of hundreds of uprising against, risings against police brutality to loot and burn down businesses. You don't have to hate Republicans. You don't have to hate Democrats. Unlike almost anyone who makes the news, you as a follower of Jesus have been given the freedom to choose to love anyone at any time under any circumstances. And St. Paul says why. It's because God's love has been poured into your heart through the Holy Spirit that has been given to you. The harvest is plentiful, says Jesus but the laborers are few. And Jesus gives us the authority to be reapers for the free and the freedom to love with his love. God give us grace in this time, especially to use it. Amen. Amen.